Raise your hand if you've seen the movie The Passion of the Christ. I've, I've seen it once. I, I won't see it again. I don't need to see it again. Um, I was talking to somebody who was telling me he's seen it eight times. Eight times. I said, you a believer? He said, yeah, sure. <laughs> I said, you've seen it eight times. He said, yeah. I said, why? He said, ah, it's, a, it's a really good movie. I said, is it? He said, yeah. I said, why is it, what makes it a good movie? He said, well, he said, you know, it's not, it's not as graphic as like the video games I play. But he said, you know, it, it just, you know, it's, it's just, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's better than your typical movie of that type. And I said, what type of movie is it? Is He said, it's a blood and gore movie. I said, okay. And I realized what I was doing was having a conversation with a man whose heart was not close to God. <laughs> I, I can't speak for anybody else in here. I saw it once. I don't need to see it again. I, just reading through the account in the Gospels makes me want to weep. So I don't need to see it again. And it brings to mind a simple truth that I know I'll get blowback for this, but I don't care. The passion of the Christ, it was hoped would be a great evangelistic tool to lead people to Christ. But it has not turned out that way. If anything, people who truly love Jesus, it has deepened their relationship. It's been a, it's been a good movie, I think, for the church. But it really hasn't been an effective movie for evangelism. Overall, Christian movies, some of them are really good. Some of them are really bad. But overall, they have not been a good, effective, evangelistic tool for the gospel. And there's a reason for that. It's because once man gets his hands on something and runs it through the circuitry of Hollywood, and scripts get rewritten, and even movies that profess to be true just have to change things just enough. It just reminds me too much, and I confess it's my own pet peeve, of Satan twisting the Word of God, because he doesn't have to twist it much, just a little bit. And the gospel can be twisted too. We can take all the offense out of the gospel. I heard someone share the gospel, and it was essentially this. Somebody's got something and you really want it. It's really valuable to you. And the only way that you can get it is by accepting that person. Would you accept him? That was the gospel. That was the gospel presentation. There's, there's no offense in that. You see, the gospel, by its very nature, is offensive to us because we have to believe and accept that we are a sinner in need of a savior. And that runs against every ounce of pride that courses through our veins. That's why it's offensive. The cross of Christ is offensive. It's offensive. And yet, to share the gospel without telling the story of the cross is not sharing the gospel. It's just making up your own story, hoping to get somebody to come to church and pay tithes. Not effective. Christian music, much the same. There was, there's been a hope in the Christian music industry. In fact, many Christian bands call themselves a ministry. There's been a hope that, that, it, that it would be a great work of evangelism, that people would come flooding in, that they would create a revival. And yet, what have we learned all through history? That you cannot create a revival. <laughs> you, can't, you can't do it. You cannot, you cannot take the place of the Holy Spirit, whether you are in a band writing songs or whether you're in Hollywood making movies. You can't. So it behooves us to take another look at the cross. Now, I'm going to read through chapter 19. We all know these events. We're familiar with them. But it's a good thing to be reminded. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. Now, he's already been betrayed by one who was one of his own, one of his closest, in fact, he was the treasurer, been betrayed with a kiss. And he's already been through a little bit of a show trial. Now he's before Pilate. Pilate 
was a ruthless man. And he was an ambitious man. He wanted a higher office. So one thing he didn't want is a rebellion. So Pilate took Jesus, had him scourged, and the soldiers, having twisted together a crown of thorns, put it on his head and threw a purple cloak around him. And they kept coming to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him with the palms of their hands. Then Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I bring him out to you so that you may know that I find no fault in him. He had him scourged so that if Jesus had anything to confess, he would confess it. Nine times out of ten, criminals would. And then sometimes they'd still have him executed anyways. And Jesus came out and said nothing. And he said, I find no fault in him. So Jesus came out wearing the thorny crown and purple cloak. Pilate said, Behold, here is the man. And when the chief priests and attendants saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. In other words, Pilate says, I'm not having any part of this. You guys have an issue with him. You crucify him. But I have to answer to Rome. I have to answer to authorities higher than me. <laughs> Guess what, Pilate? The day is coming very quickly when you're going to have to answer to authorities higher than Rome. But you know, when all, you, all you're filled with is your own ambition, you can't see that. You can't see beyond what is going to benefit you in the moment. The Jews answered him, verse 7, We have a law, and according to that law, he should die, because he has claimed and made himself out to be the Son of God. So when Pilate heard this said, he was more alarmed and stricken and afraid than before. He went into the judgment hall again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus didn't answer him. So Pilate said to him, Will you not speak even to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you, and I have power to crucify you? This is like the mayor of the town getting pulled over by the police because he's speeding and going, don't you know who I am? <laughs> oh, yes, he knows who you are, Pilate. Jesus answered, you would not have any power or authority whatsoever over me if it were not given you from above. For this reason, the sin and guilt of the one who delivered me over to you is greater. Upon this, Pilate wanted to release him. But the Jews kept shrieking, If you release this man, you're no friend of Caesar. Anybody who makes himself out to be a king sets himself up against Caesar and is rebelling against the emperor. Hearing this, Pilate brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, or the mosaic pavement. In Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about the sixth hour, about 12 noon. And he said to the Jews, See, here is your king. But they shouted, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. Have the religious leaders of the Jews forgot who their true king is? Almighty God, not Caesar. You know, if it weren't for this particular instance, the chief priests would be would be railing against Rome, would be railing against Caesar. They hated that occupation. They hated the fact that they were under the yoke of Rome. They despised Caesar. They're making themselves out to be friends of Caesar now because they've, they've made themselves to be enemies of God without even knowing it. Verse 16, Then he delivered him over to, to them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away, so he went out bearing his own cross to the spot called the place of the skull. In Hebrew, it's Golgotha, where they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. And Pilate also wrote a title, a little placard, and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this title for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, don't write the king of the Jews, but write, he says, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate replied, I've written what I've written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified him, took his garments and made four parts, one share for each soldier and also the tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top throughout. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but let us cast lots to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture. They parted my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. 
Bernie just read that psalm. But by the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Jesus, seeing his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing near, said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. And then, she, then he said to the disciple, See, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own keeping. After this, Jesus, knowing all that was finished, said in fulfillment of the scriptures, I thirst. A vessel full of sour wine or vinegar was placed there, and they put a sponge in it and put it on a hyssop stalk and held it to his mouth. And when Jesus received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Fast forward to today. It's an interesting thing looking at all these characters and in their relationship with Jesus. And it makes me think of our relationship with Jesus. It seems that everybody wants something from Jesus. Everybody. Everybody. Consider this. You know anybody that doesn't want heaven? Even atheists who believe and will tell you that we can build a heaven, we can build a paradise right here on earth. What they want is heaven. They just don't want God there. Everybody wants heaven. Everybody wants that from Jesus. Everybody desires heaven. And everybody knows in one way or another, they got to go through Jesus to get it. Even if it means despising him and building their own heaven here. Everybody wants heaven. What's another thing that everybody wants from Jesus? Money. A lot of people want money from Jesus. I've served in four churches since I've been a Christian. 35 plus years. And in every single one, there's always, there's always a couple folks that come in and that just sort of make their rounds around the church looking for the weakest lambs to get money from. It's happened in every church. Every church. I believe it happens in every church in the world. I, I've known people to steal from the offering plate. Some people just want Jesus so they can get money. It happens. It's true. Some people want a position or they want a title or they want recognition. Again, I've seen this in every church I've been in. There are people who will come into the church and say, you know what? You need to make me a deacon. You need to make me a pastor. You need to make me an elder. We, I, how many times, we've heard this so many times from so many different people. Why do I need to do that? Well, because I'm qualified. Well, good. I'm glad you were able to appoint yourself to that position. <laughs> but, but we can't do that. Here's a task. Go and faithfully do this task for service in the body. And after some time, we'll add another task to it. And if you prove yourself in these simple tasks, if you show us that you love the sheep, that you love your brothers and sisters, or as one pastor that I had said, that you're willing to wipe enough butts in the fellowship, you show us that you love them by your deeds over and over again. You show us that you can be selfless. Then we can talk about what else we might use you to do in this fellowship. Because if you want to serve, you want that title, you want that position, you better show that you're not going to use it for your own aggrandizement, for your own raising yourself up, for your own making a name for yourself. One of the things that you learn after being in ministry for some time, if you're faithful to the word of God, one thing that you will not get in the community, and you better not be looking for it, is um, a sense of entitlement, a sense of congratulations, um, a thank you, uh, appreciation. That's not the calling. That's not the calling of a servant. If you want a position or you want recognition, you're looking for the wrong thing. If you want to serve God's people, come on in and we'll open the doors. We'll fly it open for you to serve God's people. But we will know in time if that really was the intention of your heart. Some people just want a position or a title or some way to draw attention to themselves. Some people want from Jesus entertainment. If you look in Luke's gospel, Chapter 23, very interesting thing here that Herod says regarding Jesus. Luke 23. 
Verse 7. When Pilate found out that Jesus belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him up to Herod, a higher authority, who was also in Jerusalem. Now when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he had eagerly desired to see him for a long time because of what he had heard concerning him, and he was hoping to witness some sign uh, done by him or some striking spectacular performance. And then it says, so he asked him many questions, but Jesus made no reply. Some people just want entertainment. Herod wanted to be entertained. What do you think the questions were that he asked Jesus? Jesus, I got a guy over here who's blind. If I bring him, bring him to you, can, you, can you make him see? If I bring up a guy with no legs, can, can you make him walk? Jesus, here's a table. Can you put some loaves and fishes on it? I want to eat. I believe Herod was just looking for sport. He just wanted to be entertained. I've heard you can do all these things. Go ahead, do them. Show me. Some people want to be entertained. Some people will come to church because they like the music. I've known people to leave a church because they didn't like the music. <laughs> That's awfully shallow. Listen, if, if I'm in fellowship, I don't care if there's a violinist up there who's picked it up for the first time and can't tune it and it's missing a string. I don't care. If that one is worshiping God, I'm going to worship God right along with them. That ought to be the attitude of our hearts when we come in. I have a dear friend, and I was mentioning this to my wife earlier, um, and we actually served in ministry for quite a few years. Um, we were talking about the fellowships that we're a part of. And I was telling him all about all of you guys. It was a wonderful conversation. He says, wow, that sounds awesome. I said, how about you? He goes, well... You know, Sunday's are really bad. <laughs> Sunday's a great day. What, what's, why Sunday really bad? He goes, well, you, you come in, you, you sing a few songs, somebody makes a few announcements. He goes, they pass around the plate, the, the pastor gets up there, blah, 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 blah. Then we sing a couple more songs, and then we have a bite to eat, and it's done. I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, I basically sit there waiting for something to happen. I said, what are you waiting for? He goes, something. Something, anything. Something. I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. He says, Jesus healed people. The apostles healed people. I said, you want to see that happen every Sunday? He said, yeah. Yeah. I said, do you need that to have faith? He says, no, but it helps. <laughs> I'm not trying to poke fun at anybody. If, if, this, is, if this is you, I don't. But, but I was just really taken aback. I did not know this about him. I did not know this. And I said, have you ever really listened to the teaching of the Word of God? He goes, yeah, but he says, it's so boring. I just fade out after 10 minutes. And I said, brother, I said, that's not an issue with your pastor or your church. That's an issue with your heart. Where's your heart at? And we had a great conversation after that because he basically poured out all these things that he wrestled with in his marriage and in his life. With his, He just went on and on and on. And I said, well, if those are things that, are, that Jesus died to, to release you from the burden of having to carry all that, that's not your burden to carry. It was, it was a wonderful conversation. But I was stunned that he seemed to be going to church just looking for entertainment. If, you, if you're going looking for entertainment, don't. <laughs> don't do it. Sometimes you know, something might happen that's entertaining. Maybe the pastor says something that's really funny. We all die laughing. But it's always there to illustrate a point, isn't it? Because the very next sentence, he brings you right around to whatever that point was. Some people want that from Jesus. Some people want a target to mock and abuse. And I think we're seeing more, more and more of that today in our own nation. A target to mock and abuse. If they can mock and abuse Jesus and then connect you with him, they can mock and abuse you on behalf of Jesus. And did he not say that the day will come when such things you will endure? Absolutely. But he also told them, don't fear. Be strong. Be courageous. Don't fear because I'm with you. Even to the end of the age, I'm with you. Don't fear such things. These are some of the things people are looking from Jesus. But what is it that Jesus came to offer? 
came to offer himself as a sacrifice in our place. It was my place to go to that cross. It was my place to be scourged because of my sin. It was my place to be crucified because of my sin. And yet, if I had gone and been scourged and crucified and hung in that cross, it would not have atoned for my sin. You know why? Because I'm not righteous and I'm not innocent. Jesus, perfectly righteous, perfectly innocent. Just like the, the, just like the unblemished lamb. He's the unblemished lamb of God from eternity, come to this place to bear our sins. Why did he have to pray in the garden multiple times? Did you know from the garden where Jesus prayed before he was betrayed, he could see the flames from the tortures of the Romans as they were coming, as the Jews, as they were coming, as they were coming for him. He could see their torches. He knew how imminent this was. His prayers were urgent, so urgent that he shed drops of blood from his sweat and from his tears. It wasn't just because of what he was going to endure that we saw in that movie, The Passion. It wasn't just because of the physical degradation and pain and torture. It wasn't just because of the humiliation. It was because as he was getting ready to receive that horde that was coming after him, piling upon his back was the weight of you and you and you and me and you and you and the entire world, the sin of all of us, put upon one man. In light of the fact that I know I'm not qualified to carry my own sin, he carried my sin and all of yours and everybody else, all of it. How much weight is that? That's the weight of eternity that he carried on himself. And the weight of all that sin caused him to be publicly humiliated, which I deserve. Publicly mutilated, which I deserve. Publicly executed, which I deserve. And when he finally said, it is finished, it was a signal that pierced through all of space and time that says, the sins of the world have been put to death on this cross. They're done. So he has died for your sin, for your guilt, for your shame, for every past pain in your life, for every current thing that you cannot possibly bear the weight of that's in your life, he has died carrying all of that and essentially said, I've got it. It's done. It's cast away. You no longer have to bear the weight of it. In light of that, what is it that he offers us on that cross? I'll give you five things. One, forgiveness of our sin. Only God can forgive sin. Only God. Only God can forgive sin. Because every single sin we commit, even if we lie to ourselves, is a sin against God. He offers the forgiveness of our sin. Boom. Done. Over. It's forgiven. It is forgiven. It's gone. Stop thinking about it. Stop dragging it around. Stop being obsessed by it. Stop letting it hold you back from everything he wants you to walk in today. It's done. It's finished. I have to remind people of that all the time. <laughs> it's finished. Let it go. It's gone. It's gone. We forget so easily the liberty we have in Christ, in his forgiveness, to walk apart from that sin that used to weigh us down, that we used to drag around like an anvil everywhere we went. 
We have the liberty to lay it down. Secondly, he offers us his righteousness because we don't have any of our own. We don't. You know, in, in some churches, it's a very common thing. Um, and actually, I, I was reading something that uh, an atheist wrote recently because for some reason he, wants, he sends me these things. He sends letters to the editors all over the place. But somehow I got on his email list and he writes these things. This fallacy that Christians blame the fall in the Garden of Eden on Eve and use it to justify subjugating women. I've never written back to the guy, but I did today. I received this email in an attempt to set the record straight. First of all, Scripture doesn't show that. Scripture does not show that Eve is responsible for the fall of mankind. It doesn't show that. Scripture shows that Eve was tempted by the serpent, bit the fruit, and then presented it to her husband who had the headship in the relationship in that garden and the responsibility to take that fruit from her and say, honey, no, no, not this, not this. He had a responsibility to cover his wife. He failed to do so. He had the opportunity to take that fruit and bring it to Almighty God and say, Lord, Lord, don't hold this against us. Lord, forgive her. I promise you there would have been grace. There would have been grace. In that moment, God would have said, oh, Adam, that's my boy. <laughs> no, but that's not what he did. Adam took it and said, okay, baby, you say so. And that was it. In that moment, he decided she's more trustworthy than he is. I hope I was that gentle in my response to the gentleman in the email. We have been given his righteousness because we have none of our own. We, we haven't since that moment in the garden. No righteousness of our own. But we have his. And because we have his, he looks upon us and he says, this one I know. This one I know. What a nightmare it's going to be for anyone to get to eternity. And Jesus said, I don't know you. I don't know you. I know Paul, but I don't know you. Third thing that he's done on the cross, he offers us restoration of our broken relationship with God. That sacrifice on the cross and the wiping away of our sins and the imputing of his righteousness to us restores our broken relationship with God. It's been broken since that moment in the garden. And since that moment in the garden, each of us have come out of the womb screaming to have our own way. <laughs> If you've had kids, you know. If you've been a kid, you know. Screaming to have our own way. My way. My way. Sometimes we grow up and we're, we're very, very old and we're still saying, my way. <laughs> our broken relationship with him is no longer broken. It's restored. No longer is there a veil preventing us from coming into his presence. But instead, the Holy Spirit has taken up residence in us. We are his. And he is ours. And we walk day by day and moment by moment knowing that my king, my savior, my Lord died for me. And because of that, I have a relationship with my God, almighty God access to the throne. I can pray to him and no matter what it is that I've got to seek him for or present to him, I have assurance in my heart that he hears it and he's got it and that he knows the answer. He knows the end from the beginning long before I have any clue. Relationship has been restored. 
And like any relationship, it needs tending on our part. It needs tending. We tend to that relationship by spending time with him in his word. Apart from starting my day with his word, I don't know how I'd get through some of my days. I can only speak for me. There are days. I get home from work, right? <laughs> and it's, it's like I've been hammered by two by fours left and right all day long on the side of the head. But because I've been carrying his word from that morning around with me that day and been chewing on it while I'm doing my work, it's okay. Let the two by fours come. Bring two by sixes. Bring two by eights. Bring four by eights. The relationship starts there. And it continues with prayer. For many new believers, prayer is a difficult practice. Because we don't physically see him, at least for me, when I was a brand new Christian, because I didn't physically see him, I wasn't sure how to talk to him. It took a long time for me to figure it out. And I'd, I'd be within a circle or a bunch of other Christians, and we'd go around and pray, and it was like eloquence A, eloquence B. Poet C. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, people just, words would drip off, and it was like butter on toast, and I was like, I can't, I don't know how to do that. Eventually, I learned that I don't have to do that. Amen. To have a relationship with my Lord, all he asks is that I talk to him as I talk to you, as I talk to my wife, as I talk to my brother, as I talk to any of you. Just come to me, he says. You don't need any pretense. You don't need flowery speech. You don't need to sound a certain way. You know, you listen to some preachers and they have their preacher voice. And then you hear him on a radio interview and it's like, it's not the same guy. You don't have to put on some kind of air. Just come to me, he says, because now we have a relationship. It's been restored. Now relate to me, God says. Fourth thing we have is adoption as permanent heirs. We've been adopted as permanent heirs because of the sacrifice on Calvary by Jesus Christ. Adopted. We who were estranged, we were her, who were as orphans to God have now been adopted. We are his family. We are family, right? I, I like that song only because it makes me think of the Lord. <laughs> we are. We are kin. And we are kin in him. And because we are kin in him, brings us to the fifth thing. We have eternal life in the presence of Almighty God, in the fellowship of the saints in the fellowship of each other, together, in the presence of God. It just gives me chills. Uh, I want to know what the music sounds like in heaven. I really do. I really do. Because I, I honestly believe the most pleasing praise song that I've ever heard in my life here has got a pale in comparison to what we're going to be hearing up there. And we're not just going to be hearing, we're going to sing. And if you don't think you have a very good voice, in heaven, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Because I assure you, God's not worried about it here now. He's not. He's not. When we decided to put a praise team together with singers, we didn't go looking for the best singers. I, don't even, I wouldn't even know who they are. We're just looking for people that want to praise God. And that's how we ended up with this praise team. You want to praise God? Yeah, I want to praise God. All right, come on board. Can you play an instrument? No. All right, we'll teach you guitar. <laughs> we have eternal life in his presence. And in that, we're going to be busy in heaven. We're not just going to be hanging out. We're not each going to get our own cloud with our own harp. You, you know, you've seen the drawings, the cartoons. It's not going to be like that. I believe we're going to serve one another up there. I believe that we'll be in ministry towards one another. We'll be ministering to God. We, we will be at work while we're at peace, while we're in joy, while we're in the midst of his love and his light. Honestly, I don't know what that's going to be like, but it blows my mind. It blows my mind. 
that we've been given that. And in that we've been given eternal life in his presence, we have been rescued from eternal damnation in the fires of hell. And though the world around us has a real faulty notion of who the father of all lies is, Lucifer, he's not red, he doesn't have a pitchfork, and he's not the king of hell. Now these are, it's as silly as it sounds, these are common misconceptions. He's none of those things. In fact, he started out as an angel of light, did he not? Beautiful, beautiful creature. You, you would look upon him and think, that's someone I want to be friends with. It's so easy for him to tempt us. So easy. Because he comes with the things that he knows we like. Come on, come, partake. I trust, trust me, there'll be plenty of other people there partaking with you. He comes, he doesn't push us. He doesn't hammer us. Just a gentle little coaxing. Come on, come on. Waves that little flag that says, you want to follow me. That's who he is. That's the father of all lies. The best liars in the world don't come across as liars, do they? That's why they get away with it for so long. They come off as angels of light. And yet, the fires of hell were created for his eternal punishment. Don't you ever forget that, Christian. For his eternal punishment. And for the eternal punishment of all the angels that chose to follow him. And for the eternal punishment of all who renounce Christ. And I know too many people, I actually know too many people, more than I ever have in my life, who actively renounce Christ. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. The culture around us, as far as I'm concerned, they're ripe for the picking for Jesus because they're so far from God. If ever we were ripe for a revival, it's now. If ever we've needed a revival, it's now. And the only place that a revival can start is at the cross on Calvary. At that cross where he who is our peace, he who is our hope, he who is our life and our light, he who is our only hope. That's where revival begins. So as the days turn into weeks, the weeks into hours, months, years, decades, let us be ever diligent in these last days to carry that cross in our hearts with us every waking moment. Because it strengthens us, does it not? It strengthens us to remember every moment the price that has been paid for me. If my God was willing to do that, what would I not do that he would ask me to do? And secondly, because there are so many people that we know and love, and many we haven't even met yet, that need what Jesus offers at the cross. So at this Good Friday, we remember who he is, what he has done, what he has promised us, that we are no longer what we used to be, but we are not yet what we're going to be. And what we're going to be is with him for eternity. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love that is unrelenting in chasing us down and wooing us and coaxing us and leading us along. We thank you for the blood that was shed for us, for the body that was broken for us. We thank you for Jesus. Father, we thank you that that salvation is for Jew and Gentile alike. And we praise you for your goodness. Lord, pour out your spirit while there is yet time. 
that many may come, many more, to know the grace and the mercy and the love that's only available through Jesus Christ. That unless they go through the cross, Lord, unless they come to him, then they're hopeless. Father, give them hope. Strengthen our feet, strengthen our hands, Lord. Strengthen our resolve for the days ahead that we might be vessels of the truth and witnesses to a loving, gracious, and just God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.